Uh, so it's a like to be joined by uh, Patrick Davison again. Uh, Patrick, how are you keeping? Uh, good to be back um, reporting on games again. Yeah, really good. Am I the first person to be on twice, Dara? Am I that big? Y yeah. Yeah, it's this sort of oh, Premier League Yeah. So the first one must have gone okay. Not too bad, yeah. It went down okay. <laughs> good, good. No, please. Um, am I pleased to be back reporting? Yeah, it's been good. It's been a manic couple of weeks and it always feels, I don't know, it's always, it's, it's weird when you don't do it for a month, six weeks, even though it was a really short break. Um, I remember, like, I think it was Danny Higginbottom said, the first game of the season when you're reporting is a bit like your first game of the season when you're a player. This, these are his words. It's like, mm. you, just, you just maybe play it a little bit safer, you know, like if you're a defender, put it into Rose Z, just make, you just want like a seven out of 10, a solid, a solid start, find your feet again. Um, but yeah, it was quite manic. So I was, um, I was supposed to go to Reykjavik with England and that didn't happen because their COVID um, rules were pretty strict. You had to go, you had to have a test on arrival, then it's mm. five days quarantine, quarantine. And my colleague Rob Dorset did it and, and they were quite strict. They had to be in the hotel room the whole time. I think they, were, they did one walk a day where they got like a, a sandwich from a petrol station or something. But it sounds like it, you know, it wasn't the most fun five days. So I missed that. But I did go to Copenhagen for the second game. So I was there for four, four days, straight back, did a, a preview interview um, and edited it with Mourinho. Then, because obviously no fans and all games being broadcast at the moment, did West Ham uh, and Newcastle on Saturday night. And then um, it was uh, uh, Tottenham, Everton, on Sunday and then we've been doing just um, day before I speak to you we did Havertz and Werner which was great did that at Chelsea and then yeah roll on to this weekend so it's been it's been a fast start hasn't been uh, hasn't allowed for too much rustiness yeah you can even see that bit of rustiness in, in some teams probably actually the games you were at that most know would be maybe West Ham and Tottenham that just I thought you were going to say some rustiness in the questions <laughs> well, no no I didn't do too bad now I thought <laughs> It was okay, yeah, it was okay. Yeah, no, it was funny because in, the, in those games that I was at, West Ham looked, having kind of looked like they'd found something at the back end of last year, just that I think David Moyes said actually after the game, they were miles off that with basically the same 11, I think maybe one or two adjustments. They looked nothing like the team that finished last season strongly. Um, Tottenham finished last season strongly and were miles off, um, again, by their manager's own admission against Everton. But then the away, the away teams in both those games, Newcastle, who obviously have done a bit in the transfer market, looked a totally different proposition. Um, and, and Everton did as well. Uh, I was... The Tottenham-Everton game um, at the Tottenham Hotspur Stadium was only like eight weeks ago at the end of last season and it was the worst football game I've ever been to in my life really sort of dour um, and Everton just uh, Tottenham got the job done 1-1-0 one, and Everton just looked yeah, yeah just so far away from getting it together but on the evidence of one game you compare that game at the back end of last year to this game it looks like Ancelotti has just gone out bought exactly what he needs which is obviously um, a lot easier for me to say than it's for him to do. Three, they all made a difference. And they just, yeah, they really looked like they'd made progress. And set a Newcastle as well mm -hmm. at West Ham. Um, you know, just for a few years, they've dug out results, haven't they? Any result they've got has been through hard work, defensive organisation. Uh, but now you think, with Andy Carroll looking fit, Callum Wilson obviously can nick a goal. So Maximan, you sort of think Newcastle have actually got quite a few different ways to hurt teams. Um, and they look like they might be a more interesting team to watch this season, a bit more front foot. Yeah, I me mean, even on the Tottenham one, obviously I actually watched the Mourinho interview before, like your piece, um, whatever you did at the Thursday yeah. or the Friday. He seemed actually upbeat and everything. And just that second half, it's really, really poor. And after the game, it's like, we're back to square one again. But now, obviously, Gareth Bale's on the verge of uh, rejoining. I mean, that surely will give a huge boost to the squad. Yeah, I think we're all, we're all guilty of it, aren't we? You, sort of, you leap to conclusions. You kind of think, um, yeah, with um, Doherty. Now, right, because that is a big thing for Irish people, isn't it? The way yeah, people say, yeah. how, how am I doing there? 
Perfect. It's uh, yeah. Dorothy and Doherty are the, the two, I think, the main. <laughs> yeah, I see. Because I obviously, on Twitter, I follow a lot of the Irish journalists and uh, yeah. I'm friends with a lot of them. I just, you see that so often. Yeah, mm. the, uh, the criticism of that pronunciation. You thought with him, Hoiberg, Mourinho signings, they, they, they looked like at the back end of last year, again, that they'd found... You know, they got used to his way of playing. So it really looked like they'd done something. So then you're thinking, I think they bought quite well. Mourinho seemed upbeat. Uh, I think he thought it came across quite well in the documentary as well. So you leave that interview thinking, yeah, yeah I think Spurs looking okay. And then on Sunday, you think, oh, well, oh no, they're in trouble. And then, yeah, you pick, you pick up your papers and bail and maybe a new fullback as well. And... Uh, and again, and then you swing back the other way again and start thinking, yeah, well, maybe, maybe they could be, uh, maybe they could be onto something. But um, yeah, I mean, Bale would be fantastic because certainly in the times that I've covered the Premier League, I don't know whether you'd agree with it. There were Suarez in terms of in terms of absolutely dominating the league in a, in a sort of Messi Ronaldo type way. Uh, Suarez obviously did it um, mm-hmm. in his last season with Liverpool, and and Bale did it. He was sensational wasn't he yeah, before he went yeah. to Real Madrid so, so having him back if he could hit that sort of level would be would be fantastic um, and yeah if you were a Tottenham fan you thought okay Bale, Kane, Son it'd be pretty exciting wouldn't it yeah, I think even a lot made of the age. Like 31 nowadays is seen as old. Like, I mean, he surely still has a lot to give because even at, he hasn't been playing too much for Real Madrid, but even with Wales, you can always see his quality shine through. Yeah, no, I, I can remember the. Um, there was an I mean, Ireland and Wales felt they played each other. There was a nil nil anyway the, at the Aviva. Yeah, yeah. And it does, he is one of those players, like, he's almost like. You know, the really good kid at school playing against the rest of us. It, it, there's a big when he's on song. He is one of those yeah. players. There's a big gap between him and even the rest of very, obviously very good professional footballers. So um, he's an amazing player. And you could almost having watched James Rodriguez at Tottenham the other day. You could there was there and probably there still are similar question marks over him. Been at Real Madrid, not played a lot of football. Um, we know he's a fantastic player. Is he still a fantastic player? But you, you mm. can, just little bits with, Rod, with Rodriguez. He was like brilliant to watch, I thought, on Sunday. So, yeah, it's probably fair that there is a question mark. Can he get to that level where he can dominate and win a game on his own? You don't quite know. You, you, I think you can question him without questioning what he's done before. You, you just have to see whether at that age um, and having missed a bit of football and had a few injuries can he can he hit the heights or not but um, yeah blimey if I was a, a Tottenham fan or certainly a Tottenham manager I'd definitely be excited by it yeah and then as well moving on to Everton like they looked as I said before like a completely nearly different team the three um, new midfielders coming in like, how good were they actually? I mean, probably did, did they get the, enough credit um, on Sunday? Like, Tottenham were so bad. Maybe it was a bit of both that Everton were so good, Tottenham so bad. Yeah, I, I don't know. I, I thought, um, I thought within Sky they did. I'm just sort of thinking about our coverage. I know um, that Gary Neville was talking about Alan being man of the match. Um, Jamie Redknapp was doing updates during the game and he kept um, referring to the, to the little impacts that James Rodriguez was making. So, I don't know, possibly from, from an Everton fan, maybe not. I suppose you could, the um, Mourinho line about the lazy pressure, that ends up being the hook, doesn't it, for a lot of journalists. So that mm-hmm. was the back pages. So I suppose I could get why an Everton fan would be a bit like, oh, are we going to get some credit? But um, you, you couldn't have asked for more from three new signings, could you? Um, I think you, before the game, you're probably expecting uh, Hammers to take a little bit longer to adjust to the league. And yeah. you think it's going to take him a few weeks or even months to get his sharpest. So you'd definitely be pleasantly surprised by what he did. I suppose if, you, if, you can, if you're changing your central midfield, that is, you'd expect that to make a big difference to your team. Uh, and it did. Um, I can't remember the last time I saw Decore play that well, but then I guess he's surrounded by 
better players. So I don't know, maybe saying that's a bit unfair on him, but on that one game, you'd be really excited if you're an Everton supporter because their record in London was terrible. Their record away to top sides is yeah. terrible. So to see them go like that, and I think in the end, Tottenham actually did edge possession, but Everton just looked a lot more fluent, didn't they? Um, I just thought they looked the more threatening team throughout and deserved to win. Yeah, it's a hard one for Everton because like the top six have been like nearly sealed now for, for so long. Like what's the realistic ambitions for them? Like it would seventh be probably acceptable this season. Yeah, what did they fit? Was it twelfth they finished yeah. last season? Yeah. Um yeah, I mean Ancelotti Ancelotti's quite forthright when he when he talks about it. Even with sort of four or five games left of last season when it didn't look likely. He's talking about getting them into the Europa League. I think he's a manager with not a lot of pressure on his ease. He's had just the most glorious career as a, as a player and a manager. So it's, um, you know, even if they did have a bad run, I can't really imagine him not yeah. taking it in his stride. In a way, I sense that the pressure, like I say, I don't know if you could put pressure on him, but in terms of on the team, They've got a top manager now. It's hard to imagine them not being better than last season. I can't imagine they won't finish higher than 12. I think they'll play better football along the way. So whether it's seventh or eighth or ninth, I think as a fan, as long as you, you've hopes a big thing, isn't it? Um, and I think they'll have that this season because, like I say, I, I can't think that they won't be better than they were last season. Yeah, well, that's it. They can only get better. But in terms of then the other game you did on, on Saturday, West Ham, like the pressure really is probably on David Moyes now. There's a lot of talk about the ownership and I think Dean Ghana getting sold and all, and all that. Like, do you think he's under pressure straight away now? And even the fixtures look really poor for them the next six or seven. Oh, yeah. No, I haven't got him in front of me now. But yeah, it, it get, again, it seems sort of ridiculous to to start worrying about a team and a manager one game in, but that, that was kind of your banker, wasn't it? And then the rest of them, I think certainly City, Leicester, there's some really tough games to come for them. So I think, to be honest, the pressure is probably less on him than the board. Um, uh, sorry, I've got low battery on my computer. So if I, if I crash out, Gary, you'll have to... I'll have to go and get a charger. Um, yeah, sorry about that. Um, let me start the answer again. Uh, yeah, it, it seems too early, maybe, to sort of start thinking about pressure on a on a manager. But I, I get what you mean because you lose that game at home to Newcastle. That's your home banker, and then you look at the run of fixtures to come and uh, see how tough they are. All sort of top sides challenging for Europe, and you do start to worry. I think the pressure, though, is more on probably the board than it is on him. Um, the Dean Garner sale is probably the straw that breaks the camel's back um, with the supporters and the board. There's obviously a lot of resentment and unhappiness that probably stems back all the way to the change of, the change of stadium. Um, I think probably the, the fundamental problem for, for West Ham goes back to Pellegrini and the money they spent there. So you've, you've got, I think, Lanzini and Philippe Anderson were both on the bench on Saturday. So they've had one type of manager and a sporting director uh, come in and, and set up and buy players for a, for a certain thing. Jack Wilshere apparently trained every day but wasn't in the squad for the Newcastle game. Uh, and then so you buy all these players, they spent a lot of money, they backed Pellegrini, and then you're a change of manager, you have a totally different approach. Um, and that's probably why you know, there's often been a lot of criticism isn't there, of, of the director of football model. But if you change manager and go down a completely different route, a completely different way of playing, then you need to change your squad. Um, it's almost like the biggest problem for West Ham has been not selling enough. If you've got big players in on big money and you can't get them out the door, especially in a situation you've got now with a pandemic, probably very hard for them to bring new players in so that they, they needed to sell Dean Garner to fund trying to buy James Tarkovsky. So I think they're just caught in a bit of a, a pickle that probably stems ultimately from how much they spent back in Pellegrini and how unsuccessful that was. 
Yeah, and then in Newcastle, on the other hand, it's kind of been a mixed summer. The talk, the takeover is going to happen. They're all ecstatic about that, and then it fell short. And now Mike Ash seems to be spending a, a bit more money. I mean, Callum Wilson for 20, Jamal Lewis in, and then obviously Fraser and Hendrick on, on, on a three. But they actually looked pretty decent on Saturday. Yeah, no, the, Jeff Hendrick had a good debut, didn't he? He was probably, he was probably the least talked about of the new signings, but he made one, scored one, um, and did a really good job. Yeah, no, I, someone said to me on Saturday, like, was that the best week of Steve Bruce's reign as Newcastle manager, just in terms of um, the excitement, really, uh, and the optimism that was there. Uh, I was out in China, actually, when he got appointed, and you know, it's no secret that from day one, his appointment wasn't well received. He's been putting out fires and fighting the tide of public opinion ever since he walked through the door, really. But just have a week like that where they've got their targets, um, they've got players, I think I said earlier, you got some Maximan, Fraser, John Joe Shelby started the other day, Carroll, uh, Callum Wilson. You, it just feels like a totally different way of playing. And I know all along, like early in the season, last season, they lost 5 new at Leicester. And Steve Bruce was saying, I think I've tried to be attacking, I've tried to change it, but the players aren't ready for it. And um, now I think maybe they are ready for a bit of, shift, of a shift. It just looks, again, like uh, a team that can win games in a different way. They, they're not going to have to go 5 four, one They're not going to have to park on the edge of their box and nick something on the break. Um, there's just a bit more there. Um, and like I said, it was interesting. It was someone within the club saying potentially his best week as manager. Um, and it did feel that. And Newcastle, even though there's no supporters, and such a good club when there's optimism around there. Because I don't know if you've ever been to St James's Park, but it's just, it always feels like a city that could take off. And I suppose it's a fan base that when they're struggling, they can be difficult to manage because of the expectation. But if you ever did get a situation like you had in the mid nineties with Keegan and money being spent and stuff, it would be, they would be the most fantastic club to see uh, challenging for Europe or the title or something. It'd be incredible. Yeah. He's probably not appreciated by, well, maybe he's turning the fans opinions around now, but like he pretty much did the same as Rafa Benitez did last season. I don't know what the points tally was in Benitez last season. Probably just doesn't have that glamorous CV that Benitez had. Yeah, but to be honest, I think Steve Bruce gets that. If you've got um, Rafa Benitez, you want to keep him. I, I, I think for the most part, the uh, like Steve Bruce got it in the net, but ultimately that was anger that really was felt towards Mike Ashley. But you know, Steve Bruce is the guy stood on the touchline, so it's all it's directed at him. Um, so I, I don't think really it was necessarily a Steve Bruce thing. Um, and like I say, Steve Bruce himself got it. He understood why the Newcastle fans were disappointed to lose Rafa Benitez. And uh, we talked about earlier in the, in the chat with, with regards to other clubs. I just think you need, you've got to have a little bit of hope, haven't you? A little bit of optimism that you're not just going to be trudging around bottom half of the Premier League you said it there that it was similar to Rafa Benitez and I think that's right it's sort of last two seasons I think both 45 44 points which is fine I mean I don't think you could have done more than Rafa Benitez did I don't think you could have done more last season than Steve Bruce did but I can understand why as a supporter um, you wanted more um, I can remember like my early days reporting on West Brom um, I think the fans probably enjoyed you know, like the Tony Mowbray years where they were up and down, but they were playing good football as opposed to those years towards the end of their time in the Premier League recently where, um, you know, sort of bottom half, but maybe the football wasn't as good. Um, so, yeah, I know, like, there's a thing, isn't it? Like, with as a supporter, be careful what you wish for. But, mm. you know, I get it. If I was going with my kids every Saturday afternoon and watching nil-nils and one-nils and stuff like that, you need a bit more than that, don't you? Um, so yeah, another big club um, back in the Premier League are, are Leeds United. Uh, they pushed Liverpool fairly close there um, last Saturday evening. Um, Anfield, like, what do you make of them? I mean, Marcelo Bielsa, he seems um, fascinating 
in terms of obviously the interviews he does it through the, the translator and um, his even his tactics, the way he went out at Liverpool. Like, are you looking forward to seeing Leeds this season? Yeah, no, I can't wait. I actually covered quite a bit of Leeds um, early on in my Sky career. I remember interviewing Simon Grayson a lot and seeing them yo-yo around. It just, there's something about Ellen Road, they're, um, they're a huge club. It just, it just sounds right, doesn't it? Liverpool, Leeds, Leeds, Man United, Leeds, Chelsea, they just all sound, I don't know, maybe because I'm a bit older, but they just sound like big games. They're a huge club. Um, I'm looking forward to watching them. Am I looking forward to interviewing him? I guess I am. He's one of their sort of big managers, so it's a nice one to sort of to tick off. It's obviously, for people who've seen his interviews, it's a bit of a different experience to the interpreter. Although I would say, um, just watching him, he seems to be correcting his interpreter quite a lot, which makes me think his English is a lot better than he makes out. And uh, I'm sure a lot of people will remember um, Maurizio Pochettino's early days in England with Southampton where um, he sort of, well, he obviously suggested that he did, couldn't speak English and it, it, and it turned out when he got to Tottenham, he spoke English perfectly well. And uh, the reason I bring that up is because obviously Pochettino is a bit of a disciple of Bielsa. So I don't know if there's a, there's a bit of that going on and whether we might hear a bit of English from Bielsa later in the season. Um, not sure about that, but overall, uh, yeah, looking forward to interviewing him, although probably slightly nervous about it and definitely, definitely looking forward to seeing how his team plays and looking forward to going to Ellen Road again. Yeah, because I mean, the game of Liverpool are like a big scare Saturday. I think everyone was expecting a decent performance, but I don't think they all thought they'd run Liverpool back close. No, it's just... Um, Fascinating to see a, a promoted team go and go to a big stadium like that and just set about a huge team like Liverpool, you know, one of the best teams in the world. So that that was absolutely brilliant to see. And I, I'd been in Copenhagen in Denmark to see Calvin Phillips make his England debut as well. So like, what a week for for some of those players. You know, making it so strange as well, making his international debut before his Premier League debut. I think it's fair to say actually his Premier League debut went a little bit better. England were a bit, England were a bit cautious in Denmark, and Leeds was certainly anything but cautious. At Anfield, no, it was, it was great to see them, um, and they're not going to change from that, are they? Uh, they're yeah. going to go after everyone they they play against. So, um, yeah, I think uh, a few pundits have said they'll they'll give quite a few teams a big scare. Yeah, I was even watching Jamie Carragher's analysis of it. Like, they were actually nearly going man to man. I think Mane went over to the, the far side and Ailing followed them all. The yeah, way. Like, he, did on Monday night, he did that on the Monday Night yeah. Football. Yeah. No, I think, um, I think he's a great manager for, for, like, for Jamie Carragher and Gary Neville. They've been, re they've been really looking forward to seeing him and analysing him. So, uh, I, I dare say Carragher's been counting down the days. Um, till he got the chance to analyse a Bielsa team in the Premier League. I think you, you can't underestimate that. Actually, it's a real... Uh, Jamie's a massive student of the game. I mean, you can tell that in his na analysis. So, uh, yeah, he has been sort of raring to go in terms of having a little look at Leeds. I think he enjoyed that. Yeah, and then in terms of Liverpool, obviously, um, I remember recording this this morning, the news had broken that Thiago and Alcantara has uh, agreed a deal to sign for Liverpool, which is huge news. It just adds that bit of freshness to the squad. Do you think it'll be a good signing? Yeah, I think so. I, I actually remember being in Israel. When would that have been? He was captain of Spain on the 21s, I'm pretty sure. And they won that tournament. And he, he actually gave us, when we were out there, it was on the beach in Tel Aviv. It was one of the interviews I remember like, really fondly because it was a lovely setting. And it was, it was sort of weird because normally we were sort of, especially from the teams that weren't England, really kind of scrambling to get little bits of access. And, uh, and all of a sudden, like, Tiago was, um, yeah, come, come to the hotel. We'll do sort of half an hour. I did a big, long interview, hung around. And obviously, I think part of that was he thought back then he was going to come to England. Uh, and he didn't, obviously. He went to Germany. And he did. He spoke fantastic English, which is always something that you look out for. Really sort of bright guy, engaging character. Um, I seem to remember him scoring that fight. He absolutely dominated the, the final in that um, under-21 tournament. And Spain won it. So, yeah, a brilliant player that we've all enjoyed seeing for a, a few years. So... 
Yeah, he is one of them, isn't he? You get you kind of get used to it. I remember in the early days of the Premier League when big name foreign players came in, like Klinsman, you were like, what, really? They're coming to England? And it was so exciting. And and now, because the Premier League's so global, you can you can numb to it a little bit. But I do think Thiago's one of those, not just as a Liverpool fan. Um, I think if you're, maybe if you're a City fan or a Chelsea fan, United fan, you're a bit like, oh no, they're going to be even better. But as a neutral, he's, he's an exciting signing as well. And for a journalist, like I say, because of that, story that I tell you from uh, from Israel. He is he's a really good talker, speaks really good English. So hopefully it'll be good for us at Sky as well. Yeah, and I think it probably was crucial for Liverpool just to add at least one another guy back up left back. Just to add that even one, two players just to, to keep the competition in the squad as well. Yeah, it, it can it can change. It can change quickly, can't it? I think the uh, none, none of their front three are old, but you sort of they're at sort of the latter end of their 20s. And mm. you saw with City last year, didn't you? What, did they lose nine Premier League games? Yeah. And you sort of think, having got 100 points, 98 points, you sort of think, well, I mean, to, to, to beat City, you're going to need to be in the high 90s. And Liverpool were. But what we saw with City is then fall off quite dramatically. So just because you've been brilliant for a couple of years like Liverpool have, it's, there's no guarantee that you're going to keep it. And... People like Gary Neville, who have been in title winning teams, talk about that, don't they? Just the need to freshen it up, change the dynamic. I mean, Liverpool have, it seems a bit harsh to say because obviously they've been so successful, but you have just seen in the last month or two, I suppose after lockdown, and, and to be fair to them, they already had the league in the bag, but you've seen a little dip from them being yeah. absolutely relentless. I think that's fair to say. So, Having someone like that, certainly it will lift the supporters and yeah, maybe within the dressing room as well, just changes the dynamic. I suppose the, the worry would be because of COVID, does it then mean that someone else has to go? Obviously, there's been a lot of talk about why now them. Um, I'm not sure, but I, th- I think ideally for Liverpool, you, you add to it and, and don't lose anyone. Yeah, I think the talk is when Alden will probably stay, but it looks like... That's the latest, remember- isn't it? Uh, Rian Brewster will be the one possibly to make way, which is a, a shame because I actually really rate him and he hasn't probably been given it a proper chance yet. No, but you, you're seeing a little bit of it, aren't you? Maybe, um, look, with the goalkeeper, Arsenal, Martinez, if you could suddenly, because Leno's been injured, Martinez plays, does really well, his value goes up. So there's sort of, there's an opportunity for Arsenal there to, to bankroll the players they do need to bring in and mm. and probably Liverpool don't want to sell Rian Brewster. Um, probably ultimately West Ham didn't want to sell Dean Garner but if you've got other areas of the team that you need to strengthen uh, for most clubs there just isn't a bottomless pit so um, yeah like it's one of them. Ideal world you keep Rian Brewster he's a really good character as well really like him and like you say looks looks very very promising but we're probably working in a world now where all or most teams need to cut the cloth a little bit. Yeah, I mean, one team, I know they had the, the Hazard money and Morata, but Chelsea, obviously they brought in five, six signings. They weren't that impressive um, on Monday night, but they got the job done. Uh, like, how do you see them going this year? You know, it's, it's an interesting one. Um, I suppose the, the major reservation at the moment, um, I'm sort of working off Monday Night Football here, is, is, is the goalkeeper and, and just the strength with which uh, Gary Neville in particular says you just can't, you cannot win a league or challenge for a league without a top level goalkeeper. And you sort of saw it on Monday, did not you? You, you? Especially you're away, you're 1 0 up, you can see the goal you shouldn't concede. And then that, those games, especially once fans are back in, if when that happens, suddenly it becomes a really, really hard game but beyond that I think it's it's pretty exciting what they've done I've just actually um, a, a day before you and I chatting I've done uh, an interview for Sky for, for Sunday with uh, with Havertz and Werner and they're really impressive characters spoke really good English I think Werner made, made a good start didn't he um, he was talking about maybe the space in the Premier League and with his pace he looks like he'll be really dangerous player. Havertz didn't make the quickest start, but then, you know, he's, he's 21. Uh, he's 
had a very short pre-season. I think he's been in the country just over a week or so. So I wouldn't be rushing to judge. And also you've got that element of, of gelling the team together. You've got Ziyech. Uh, I was actually at the training ground, just in the corner of the training ground. We could see him doing his um, fitness work. And, you know, I wouldn't be a physio, Dara, but he didn't look like he was a million miles away. Yeah. Um, they were really putting him through his paces. So, I, yeah, I think they've... They've signed really exciting players. So um, I think, can they improve position in position? It might be a little bit too soon to get above Liverpool and City, but I think Frank Lampard was talking about closing the gap. You'd yeah. say Chelsea would close the gap, I think, wouldn't you? That, that huge points gap from <laughs> Liverpool to them will, I think, be smaller this year. Yeah, you'd have to think that I mean, 33, it was 33 points last year. So, I mean... If they can Knowledge. even get it down. Yeah, well, when you get 99 <laughs> points, it's easy. Just get the, it's the 66. So. <laughs> yeah. Um, but yeah, even if they can get it maybe down to, to below 10 and then kick on next year, I think that probably is a realistic aim. But let's be honest, when you spend that money, you have to show some progress. Yeah, yeah. They, they, I think they've got to... Not, not necessarily win the league, but show some sort of challenge. Um, obviously, Liverpool made such a fast start last season. Yeah. I mean, Chelsea would have known the gap was too big probably like by October. So just to have some sort of yeah. idea that the gap's closing. This Sunday, it's only second game, but that'll, that'll probably tell us a lot. I think it would really take the wind out of Chelsea's sails. So yeah. Liverpool went to Stamford Bridge and did a bit of a job on them. Um, then probably you're talking, not not pressure on Frank Lampard, we're not talking about that yet, but just kind of like we saw with Tottenham against Everton, you, you have that build-up, you feel like you made a couple of good signings, you feel like you ended the, the last season in good shape, and just to have a really bad day would, would really, yeah, wind out the sails is, is probably the right way of putting it. But um, yeah, I haven't interviewed Werner and Havertz, uh, yesterday, I think they see it a bit like that. They see that as a, it is a big early test of themselves. They'll, they'll be very, very motivated, I think, as you'd expect, Chelsea against Liverpool. So it'd be, it'd be really interesting to see how they go. And I think it'd be interesting to um, to see how Liverpool's go as well. But it's been away from home has been where they've been a bit more vulnerable, hasn't it, in the last couple of months? So it'd be it'd be a big statement as well for Liverpool if they went to Chelsea and showed the very best of themselves, having looked a bit vulnerable themselves against Leeds. Any team, either of those teams, winning big, producing a top draw performance, I think would be a big statement for them. Yeah, it'd be interesting to see the mindset because I think Liverpool will be going into that game knowing that anything short of a win is points dropped because they, they know that standard they've set now the 90 plus points every year that even draws are feel like losses at times so it'll be interesting to see how Chelsea approach the game because you only get two chances to take points off Liverpool yourselves so yeah. if they were going for the title you'd nearly have to think that a win even at this early stage would be needed if you like yeah you might you might be right if, if Chelsea weren't to win Already, you'd be like, right, well, the, the gap's still still pretty big. But, you know, you, we might be coming away from that spell. We've, we've got used in the last few seasons, haven't we, high 90s being mm -hmm. the total that you need. And, and maybe maybe you could do sort of three, four defeats if you don't draw many games. Um, but Liverpool have looked a bit more vulnerable in the last couple of months. Um, Man City looked vulnerable throughout last season so maybe you're in it maybe we're going back to the sort of the, the heady days where you could lose six games and still win the league I remember when Blackburn won the league they lost seven so I don't know I just I've just got a slight feeling that the the total that's needed to win the league won't be as high this time round um Liverpool could certainly lose at Chelsea and, and recover from that very easily so, actually, the more I think about it, the more you think it's, it's bigger for, for Chelsea. Liverpool know how good they are. They know they can go and win things. They've had the little lift, it looks like now, the Thiago sign-in. It, it's, it's, a, it's a bigger examination of where Chelsea are and, and how well they've spent their money. They're the ones with the gap to close. We know about Liverpool. We know what they can do. 
Yeah, I mean, and then obviously, the two Manchester clubs return to action this weekend as well. Let's we'll start with United. Um, obviously, we've got Donny van de, de Beek in, but there seems to be a bit of restlessness in the fan base that Jane Sancho isn't in, and so probably, they're probably looking at Chelsea, who were very similar to them last year, and they have all the new signings. So, how do you think they'll get on this year? Yeah, no, I'm quite swayed yeah, by the argument that I've heard that simply having Bruno Fernandes the whole season will make them much closer. I do think they'll be much closer. And I don't know, it's like the transfer window is an industry all in itself, isn't it now? Like if you don't, you buy a player and it's like onto the next player, who are we going to sign now? Um, and I think I do think United are much better off. It seems like Sancho to United will happen at some point. I'm not saying in this window, but it, it just it feels like a move that's going to happen at, at some stage. So you're better off waiting, maybe moving on if you have to, than just because if you spend all that money, you think about like even the early days of David Moyes. Um, it, initially, it was sort of Bale and Fabregas, and you end up. It felt like you buy Fellaini, so you buy Fellaini. To so you spent some money, so people are happy. Then, then you buy them. I think the next time it was Matter in January. Actually, yeah. and you sort of think, so how like how do those players work in the same team? So you can you can spend money just to sort of take the edge off the fan uh, frustration. And but then ultimately, it's like we're saying with Chelsea, those players have got to do something good on the football pitch at risk of states and the blinding logos. They at some point they have to produce, or that money becomes wasted money. It's, um, you, you think back to the start of last season, Liverpool got all those points, just get pipped by City. You think, God, how are Liverpool going to go again? They don't really... Um, was it just Adrian that they brought in? They didn't do a lot anyway, did they? Pretty much. You got a couple of young players in, yeah. That was it. Yeah, and, and, then, and then look at what they did. They, started, they, they won the season in the first couple of months, really, with the unbelievable form. So... Um, I suppose it, it sort of depends on results and how the new signings go. But I think Danny van der Be- uh, Donny van der Beek sorry, is, a, is a, um, another step in the, in the right direction. Um, and don't go big spending money if you don't have to. It's Gradually, in the last sort of couple of windows, United look like they're making steady progress. We yet to see Bruno Fernandes over a whole season. He made a huge difference. Um, after joining in January so yeah I think there's, there's certainly it makes sense I can understand the argument that United are more likely to become challenges to City and Liverpool than Chelsea are they're a bit more settled uh, they look good that front three looks really dangerous they have added something although not as much as um, probably fans would have hoped but you, you, know, you don't need to spend 200 million on five or six signings to have a good season yeah, I think it's nearly gone under the radar in some ways that obviously people are talking Chelsea up for the title and the pressures on Lampard. I mean, United has spent, I think, £240 million since um, Solskjaer's first full season. So, like, there is, there has to be some elements of pressure. You know, they can't be going into a top fourth is OK. You know, you'd have to show up progression like Chelsea this season. Oh, yeah, they definitely will. They definitely will need to show progression. But I just think they've... It, it, just gradually over the last however many months they've improved I think overall Paul Pogba looked like he had an appetite for it the sort of the talk of it, it seemed like a matter of when he would leave that doesn't look like it would happen so they've got they got good they do need more in attack but the front three looks really dangerous um, they've got good midfield options now haven't they like uh, Van der Beek Pogba and You've got Fred, McTominay, uh, obviously Fernandez. So I would say they're not too far off. You've got two good goalkeepers. And I, I just sort of repeat what I said earlier, really. Um, you, you're better off to do it in stages and get the right player and, and not be taken for a ride, which you sometimes feel like United are a target for that. Better off to do that um, than to be to be fleeced. Take it, take it steady. They, they have look like they're making progress. It's hard to think that without Bruno Fernandes, they won't be at least a little bit closer. So, um, yeah, I, I, again, I can, I can understand fans being disappointed and wanting more, but you're better not to be taken for a ride and, and just 
don't spend money just to keep people happy because if they don't work out then that happiness will be so short term yeah i think we're even in the world now where you go on the likes of twitter and that if you see any sort of new signing it just it's all about nearly retweets and the fans are happy and that and it might even be the right ones yeah that's right and it's, it's a machine um in itself isn't it you just see like how long does does excitement last for a new signing now it's like great, okay, we've got Van der Beek yeah. or we've got whoever, we've got Havertz, we've got Werner, whichever club it might be. And it's straight away, it's on, to, it's on to the next one. It's almost like it's divorced from the actual reality of what happens on the pitch. I agree with what you said earlier, that they'll, they'll need to make progress. And if they didn't start the season well, then there would be pressure on. But I, I, I can't see why United wouldn't be closer. Again, you, you keep I keep going back to Bruno Fernandes, Mason Greenwood had a breakthrough season. And Greenwood, Marshall, Rashford is exciting, isn't it? Um, if you've got Van der Beek, Pogba and Fernandes in the same midfield, probably you'd think two from three and they'd have to have a, a sitter like a Matic in there. Um, it's, it's a good team. It's, I don't know, what would I... If I, if I guessed top four now... I'd probably still go Liverpool, Liverpool, City, United, Chelsea in that order still. Yeah, I mean, you'd, you'd probably, you'd have to think, I mean, the other team, obviously, we haven't, actually haven't spoke about is, is Arsenal and they actually do look impressive. I watched them against Fulham and it was just a calm, solid performance and Arsenal are now suddenly looking like a hard game. I mean, Liverpool are playing in, in a couple of weeks. They're looking like a hard game again. They're like, they look solid defensively. Mm. Yeah, there was, all, there was sort of, with Arteta, obviously a lot of Guardiola talk in terms of old Arsenal managers. Could he get back to the glory days of Arsene Wenger? It's almost like he's gone in and done a bit of a George Graham. I mean, I'm going well back there, but late 80s, George Graham got rid of a lot of superstars in the Arsenal team, brought in likes of Alan Smith, um, who obviously I work with now, but but kind of people who weren't known so much then, but just made, obviously, built the, uh, the famous back form, just made Arsenal tough and hard to beat first. And it feels like that's almost what's happened with Arsenal now. They've had, suddenly they've started getting results against the big teams, obviously City and Chelsea in the Cup, Liverpool in the league, Liverpool in the Community Shield as well, albeit that's a, you know, a glorified friendly, really. But yeah, I, I agree with you totally. They couldn't, on a bit of a budget, they, they suddenly they just look tough, don't they? And with Obama Yang, they can hurt teams. So I, I don't know. I, I look, you look at the squad definitely at the moment and think they'd still have an effort to finish above the four we talked about: United, uh, Chelsea, City, and Liverpool. But but still, um, in in terms of what they, I don't know, it's hard to think because they won the FA Cup. What would progress be? I think Arsenal will get more points and they'll finish nearer. The top four so in that respect I think I'd expect to see progress from Arsenal yeah and then the other team obviously in the top six is Manchester City and you'd have to think that they're under more pressure than most I mean last season was was disappointing by, by their high standards and um, going out to Leon in the Champions League was just such a low for them like how do you see them getting on um it'll be I just think they'll be they're very interesting, aren't they? Um, Guardiola's never stayed this long as a manager. He's never had to do a rebuild, which you sort of you're in that territory with City now. I just think they looked vulnerable throughout last season. They just uh, certainly when Aguero wasn't in the team, they looked like they would let teams off the hook. I even remember like a cup game with Newcastle, where they absolute Newcastle never got out of their penalty box. You still had that, do you remember, like that amazing chance for Dwight Gale, which yeah. I think would have made it 1-1. So it was like any team that could stay in the game had a chance. And yeah, that, that um, I watched it at home. That, that Leon game was a real sick you know, There was obviously a lot of questions asked about the team selection that night. Why were there so many of the sort of ball players? It felt like quite a negative selection. Um I'm not sure if that really adds to the pressure. Look, he, he, he built, um, if you compare Guardiola's title winners to uh, Mancini's and Pellegrini's, he made he made City such a brilliant team to watch and so dominant in a way that we've, we've not seen before. Obviously, he's obviously got the faith of the board. So, 
I don't think there's pressure on him in that respect, but it'd just be interesting to see how they go. Questions have been asked of him that have not been asked before. He's having to do things he's not had to do before in terms of that rebuild we talked about. So it'd just be really interesting to see how they go. I think, um, and I hope Nathan Ake will go well because I think he deserves it. I think he's brilliant for Bournemouth. Uh, He's good on the ball. He's a good fit. So... Uh, if they can, and maybe they'll add another centre back. So if they're more solid, m- maybe we will see them get back to being um, dominant. But it's, it's kind of like we said with Chelsea. It, it, if you're if you're leaking a goal, then whoever yeah. you play against, they've always got a chance. And maybe that affects the mentality of the opponent. If you you know right, stay in this. We'll have our moment. Um, and the very best teams. They sort of crush all hope, don't they? You just know that you're not going to get a moment. You're not going to get at the other end of the pitch even, which a City were like that for a couple of seasons. So, I don't know. Um, I think it's very hard to predict with City, but I think it's it's fascinating as a, as a viewer, a fan or whatever, because because there there is that unknown with them. Yeah, it will be interesting to see because even last year at Anfield, I thought they played brilliantly, like passing the ball and it, like they're be- they're a better passing team than Liverpool. But you just saw Liverpool yeah. defensively more solid and they- and they took their chances. Mm, mm. Yeah, and they obviously they 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 hammered Liverpool um, after lockdown, didn't they? But you, you've certainly had that feeling uh, quite a lot, certainly Anfield and Liverpool City games that. Um, Liverpool could easily cope without the ball and City wouldn't compromise their principles at some point. And, and, and at some point, that the front three, Liverpool would just click and rip through City. Uh, saw the goals again the other day, actually. It was it finished 3 1, didn't it? The game at Anfield. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Liverpool scored such brilliant goals. Um, I don't know. And it just feels like, especially at Anfield, if you've got that vulnerability, Liverpool are going to find you out at some point. You've 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 almost got no chance. It doesn't matter how you win a lot of those games. The Champions League game, certainly get the first three. So those City that are most likely winners. The ones just scored three goals quickly. And then in terms of a team that people have been told about, who do you think will have a good season? Maybe from a bottom half. Or a um, mid-table team? Um, that's an interesting one. I, th- I think of, of the teams, like in the bottom half, we, the team that springs to mind is Everton. Have it, having seen them on Sunday. Um, but we've already discussed them a little bit. I think they will... They just look like they, they filled the gaps that they needed to fill and they'll be... Uh, they'll, they certainly won't finish 12th again. It'd be interesting to see Sheffield United. I, I just... I mean, they were sort of out of that game against Wolves the other night before it even started, yeah. really, weren't they? 2 0 down in, what was it, seven minutes? Um, it, it, it's hard to imagine them. It'd be very difficult for them to have as good a season again. It'd be interesting to see Villa, because they've, they've spent a good goalkeeper, obviously, good centre forward. It'd be interesting to see how they go. Uh, you, you'd sense Villa wouldn't, maybe not top half, but you'd think they'd have a, it would be less of a struggle than it was um, last year. Maybe Newcastle, actually. Um, they're, they're probably the two teams, are teams that you and I have discussed already, Newcastle and Everton, based on what they've done in the transfer market, um, based on what we saw last weekend, just look like they've added a dimension. They look like they'd be able to take the game to teams more effectively, dominate games. Um, so I... Yeah, I'd say Everton definitely top half, and I fancy Newcastle for top half as well. Uh, and um, obviously, before the season started, there was international games play. It was a bit odd, actually. It just messed up the, the pre-season in, in many ways. But obviously, you were you were following England. Um, how did they get on? Because I only watched a tiny bit of it. It just seemed fairly boring, if you like. Yeah, I think it was a bit on the picture. It was it was a bit disappointing just because it's since the World Cup. It, it's been a bit of a uh, they've been on a bit of a crest of a wave, and they've just been they've been quite an exciting team for a little while. I think England they've, they've been really dispatching teams, scoring a lot of goals. So it was a bit disappointing to see them so laboured. Again, you can apply to England um, 
what you can apply to a lot of Premier League teams. It's, it's early. You just said it there, messed up pre-season. How much can you really judge what they did? I'm not sure. Uh, but obviously, off the field, it was it was a catastrophe. It was <laughs> they just Gareth Southgate had such a tough couple of weeks. And on it, yeah, I think it was just a bit disappointing. The Rice Calvin Phillips midfield was maybe a, a bit kind of negative, and I just not that you know, so that Denmark decent team they can easily beat England certainly at home, but I, it would just would have been nice to see them take the game to them a little bit more and be what they've been for a couple of years now. So um, yeah, probably the worst camp for Southgate since. Um, do you remember them when they qualified for the World Cup? The old paper airplanes got chucked onto the pitch, and um, it was all the early days of Southgate were were tough, and they were struggling to score, and fans were quite bored. And it hasn't been like that for a while, and it was just it was just a bit more like that. It was a, it was a bit disappointing having seen having seen so much progress, but. Um, I certainly wouldn't write them off. Look, Iceland and Denmark get decent results against lots of teams, don't they? And they've been away to both those teams in really difficult circumstances and got four points. So they did all right, I suppose. Yeah, and you mentioned kind of the afterfield stuff. I mean, why is it always nearly England's that get in, you know, the players are always, there's always some sort of story to, to report on that is, is outside of football. Yeah, it does feel a bit like that, doesn't it? It does feel a bit like that. Um, I think the scrutiny is just enormous. Uh, it's even um, so, had the had the lads had that happened to Mason Greenwood or Phil Foden with their clubs, I'm not saying it would have wouldn't have been a story. But with with England, I found, and I haven't even covered that many England games. I think I've been away on four trips with England, but it's it's so magnified. The attention is so great. So I think a part of it, at least, is. It just feels bigger with England. These things happen that they're not the first two England players to make mistakes. They went with the last. I remember it was being talked about on the day. Southgate was part of the team in '96, where England had some real characters. Um, I don't know if you, you'd remember the old dentist chair thing. I've heard about it. Yeah. Euro '96. Yeah, yeah. I thought you might be too young, Dara. But uh, <laughs> yeah. it just—it's—it's it's always been there. It's not new. They can come back from it. And I think there is, like I say, an element of, had that happened to, to Mason with United or to, to Phil Foden with Man City, it would have been back page news. But you see when it's England, it was, it was even on a few front pages as well. So it's just, I don't, I don't know. I don't know why it's the scrutiny is even more, but it does feel like it is, definitely. Yeah, and he had, he, so he had the, the Harry Maguire stuff. He, named, he had to name the squad the day of his, obviously, his course. So it just nearly even fell very badly for him on that day as well. Yeah, it did. I think he was keen to back Harry Maguire because he knew Harry, Harry Maguire's version of events before the rest of us did. So that was, I thought he dealt with that actually on reflection quite well, Southgate, because he, he wanted to, to back the player. And he did. And then when more information came out, he, he sort of he changed his view. And he said already that Maguire will be back in in October. Southgate's very good at negotiating big issues like that. He's spoken well about Brexit before. He's spoken well about, um, you know, the, the crisis caused by the, the pandemic at the moment. So he's really, really good at that stuff. Actually, the, the, the thing with Phil Foden and Mason Green is probably the first time I've seen him, he just... That first press conference he did, so he'd found out at breakfast that morning, and I think two hours later he was doing a press conference, and he just seemed, I don't know, confused, betrayed, like angry, and he's normally very good at hiding that, and I still think he did a pretty good job, like I say, he's of for all those bits that come with England, he's fantastic at dealing with that, but that that. Um, it definitely rocked him that the Foden Greenwood thing really, you know, it, it had him reeling for sure. Yeah, I mean, what's the realist? Obviously, you're in England. What's the the aim for this England English uh, side? Like, they're young. There's a lot of young players um, coming through the ranks and everything. Like, is it is it to win the Euros next year? Yeah, yeah, I think so. 
Um, especially with games at Wembley, you'd say that gives them a fighting chance. Um, it seems a bit more far-fetched after seeing the last two games. Um, but I think what it is, they feel like maybe they haven't got a centre-half partnership good enough in the really big games, like Belgium, yeah. France, like the very best teams. Are England going to be able to resist the team that good? And you, I think I mean, England could win a game against them, but you wouldn't be putting any money on it. So they're trying to... He toyed with three at the back again against Denmark. Is it a case, it's about finding a way to beat the very best teams? Um I don't know. And as a neutral, I don't know. I think I think England aren't a million miles away. Um, is it? Am I being very English to say they they may be top five in the world? But it's just a case of saying, would they? Could they beat France and Belgium? I think they yeah. even feel themselves that in those really against the very very best teams, they might come up a bit short unless they find something. But I think the stated aim is to be the best team in the world. Um, and for, for at times in the last couple of years, they haven't looked a million miles off that. Um, yeah, it's just a case of can they find that something? I don't know whether it's a formation change or something. They just look, they just look a little bit short of centre half, and then just in midfield finding that sort of. So you had Rice and Calvin Phillips, and then like just find a way of playing through teams and um, keeping the ball a bit more smoothly, which is obviously uh, seems to be an issue for every country in, in our part of the world now, doesn't it? Yeah, I, I know too well <laughs> um, watching Ireland over the years. <laughs> they had a go, didn't they, Stephen Kenny? Yeah, uh, but it was a Shane Duffy header at the, at the back post as per usual. Yeah, yeah. Never wrote well. Don't turn your nose up at it, Dara. Yeah, I think it's just it's going to take time, but it's whether he'll get the time. I think he will buy the, the FAI and that they, they see the vision and all that. It's just by the supporters. There was a, I wouldn't say negativity, but you could just even see after he losing to Finland at home, like that was a get, real chance maybe to show that we can we can actually do it. And it was just the usual frailties that we just no real creativity in midfield and no one put no one to put the ball in the back of the net. I mean we took Robbie Keane for for granted, really. Mm. Yeah, no, it's it's difficult, isn't it? And again, all those things that have been a theme through a lot a lot of things we talked about. It's um it's pre season again like we had we had it with England and Ireland would have had exactly the same issues. Just the logistical feat of getting all the players there back from holidays quarantining testing uh, and then to expect Ireland in this case to suddenly turn up and play in a totally different way and be smooth and start ripping teams apart it's probably not that realistic um, the problem for Ireland and England is, is probably more sort of deep rooted isn't it in terms of we don't tend to produce that kind of player as often, do you, do you remember sort of all those years ago, Guardiola saying, like in Spain, we've got 10 Jack Wilshere. Yeah. Yeah. I think the reaction over here was almost a bit like, no, you haven't, no, you haven't, but they, they do. They've got, they, yeah. other countries produce so many of these players. So if one player doesn't quite realise their potential or they get a lot of injuries, to someone else. Um, and for England and Ireland, you're probably relying on one or two players and it needs a more fundamental change, which, which I think, it, is happening. England, England are are producing a lot of exciting young players, but at the moment they tend to be sort of loaded in those front wide areas. So if South, you've got you've got about hundred players in those positions, but you just maybe lacking. Yeah, sort of. I don't know. Maybe Harry Winks would be the closest thing we've got to someone. Phil Foden potentially, although he's probably a bit more progressive rather than a number six. Just that guy to take it off the back foot. It, it, the thing is, you can take players for that, like that for granted. Just a player who can drop in, you know, your centre back split. The guy drops and takes it off the keeper, takes it off the centre half, never loses the ball, never gives it away. Um, they're not always the most eye catching players, but they're so, you know, they're, they're so brilliant, so invaluable to a team. Yeah, I mean, the problem for Ireland is that uh, right, Kenny is trying to put the young players in, but I think oh, we have good young players coming up, but they're all nearly in the forward areas. You know, Aaron Connolly, Ida, Parrish, and yeah, Obafemi at Southampton. Like they're nearly all in the same position. Like, we don't really have that midfielder coming up. 
No, no, and, and England don't either, really. Um, yeah, and it's it's more of a riddle, isn't it, in a, in international football? I don't know. You can't a, a club can go out and we talk about Everton a lot. These are the gaps by him, him, and him, and we'll be somewhere close. For an international manager, it's much harder, isn't it, to find something within, maybe come up with a clever tactical solution, do something to give you what you haven't got. So, like with England three at the back, if you, if you don't think your centre-halves are, are quite strong enough as a two, you go three at the back. So, yeah, for Southgate and for, for Stephen Kenny with Ireland, they're, they're, that's what they're going to have to do, isn't it? Find some way within what they've got to hide their weaknesses. Yeah, and I'll finish up with uh, sort of one funny one on the, the last day of the, the season. Uh, I think you were at Arsenal, Watford. And obviously yeah. Watford just got relegated and you had to do an interview with Troy Deeney. Um, like, it went viral fairly quickly. Like, I was just looking at Twitter and it was mil- a million views that night or whatever it was. Like, it just blew up. Uh, I won't say what he said, but, like, what was your, your thinking about asking the question? Uh, yeah, so he, he called me a name, didn't he? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so, I... What was I thinking? He, so he started talking about his knee and uh, would he would he be at Watford? He, he, he himself was questioning would he be at Watford next season? And I, I suppose I just had a little thought of, he kept talking about his fitness, he kept talking about finishing with Watford. I sort of thought, is he, is he sort of hinting at something? And I didn't, I kind of wondered, would he, would he go down and speak to another reporter and say, look, this might be it? So I, I suppose it was a bit of just, base covering really and just sort of making sure um that I didn't miss something that that's I think that's always a worry really that you, you don't want to miss a big story and especially one like ones like that are sometimes difficult because it's sort of mid-interview it's kind of happening and you're thinking okay is he hinting at that and then I listened back to him and I thought well no he wasn't so you know I probably went a bit left off the tee with that but he was you know, in terms of, like you say, views and hits, it wasn't, I didn't get there the, the conventional route or um, the way I wanted to, but it was an interesting interview. <laughs> you know, he, he spoke like he always does really well. I, I don't think he was um, uh, genuinely annoyed. He went off and did some other bits and came back and apologised again. So yeah. it, it was it was fine. It's just... Um, it's just that it's the hardest bit of the job, really. It's that tightrope you're always walking between the short term and thinking, right, is the story, is there a story there? Do I want to ask that? And thinking about your long term relationships. So, um, yeah, I, if I had my time again, knowing what I know now, I wouldn't obviously ask it. But it just felt a little bit at the time like he was he hinting at something bigger than just leaving Watford and just being relegated. Um, and it sort of, it just felt like that at the time. So I thought I don't want to, the worst case scenario for me in my head at that moment was him going down to the BBC or whoever and saying, uh, well, yeah, this might be it because of my knee. That was it really. Yeah, I mean, he probably couldn't have apologised anymore. <laughs> I think he four or five times afterwards. So, um, but in terms of actually just one last one, like it, players or managers like who's the ones you like to interview after the game that, that just really engages with you um Southgate's really good I really enjoy interviewing him for England because he, he gives sort of quite short quite concise um he'll offer something tactically he'll discuss that a little bit which a lot of managers won't um like I've already touched on he's he's very uh, good at negotiating big issues so he's a really enjoyable guy to to interview after the game um, I mean Klopp, Klopp is always exciting one way or another because he doesn't did we talk about this last time we spoke like he just doesn't edit he doesn't he's talked about he doesn't prepare for interviews so he'll just yeah. come out and say what he wants to say and sometimes that can mean you get your head bitten off as a reporter but I'm sort of at the point now with a job where I don't mind that that much. Mm. Um, people will often say, like, oh, like, what was that like? How did you cope with that? I bet you were terrified. 
Um, but do you know what? Actually, the, it's more it's more terrifying, if that's the right word, to if you sort of three or four questions in, you're thinking, oh, this is not going well. He's not saying anything. He's just like flat back and everything. And in in some ways, that can be more challenging because then you're in your brain thinking, right? How can I how can I get something going here? Whereas you don't really have to, you know, with club a lot of the time, you're just sort of holding the microphone. You, 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 the, a club interview can be good with you as a reporter offering almost nothing to it. So, yeah. Um, you know, anyway, so he, he, can, he can be good. Uh, Frank, Lampard, Frank Lampard's a really good talker. I mean, Guardiola tends not to enjoy the process, but, but, but can be good. Um, Chris Wilde is good, very honest. Nuno's at Wolves is tricky because he's quite a lot of short answers, um, but he's he's a nice guy off camera. So they've, they've all got their different. You just get into a bit of a a routine with them. You get to sort of work them out, and that's what I've got to try and do once I start doing BL. So just find uh, maybe watch a a bit of what he's done with other reporters and just figure out a way of going about it. And that's why actually Mourinho is always tricky because sometimes we'll come an hour and a half before kickoff. Sometimes it'll only come half an hour before kickoff. Sometimes he'll give a seven-minute answer. Sometimes he'll give a seven-second answer. And I actually find him the... You know, he's good. He's good value. But he's, he's you, you watch that feature that we did with him before the first weekend and he's all smiley and lovely. And then he, I saw him again two days later and he's, he's you know, obviously the last bit's a totally different type of interview. So... Mourinho is sometimes the trickiest one in terms of just figuring out what he's going to be like and just you don't know what guy's going to walk through the door. And then to wrap up in the words, uh, who's going to win the league? Uh, so you're going to give me tenner and I'm going to put it on yeah, Liverpool. You couldn't, after the last couple of seasons, uh, this isn't a word obviously, by the way, I'm, I'm rambling. Yeah, yeah. Um, <laughs> Yeah, and we're, look, we're speaking sort of an hour or two hours after the news about Thiago broke. Uh, that probably tips it for me. I just think City, have, there's a lot of unknowns with City, um, having lost so many games last season and needing maybe a little bit of a rebuild. Chelsea, um, have got a lot of new signings. Man United are heading in the right direction, but probably haven't done enough. So how could you bet on any of them finishing above how good Liverpool have been so one word Liverpool Perfect. I'd be more than happy for that to happen as well <laughs> I know you would I know you would if you were a different if you support a different team I'd have given a different answer well that's why I wouldn't, I wouldn't, I I wouldn't, that's why, <laughs> why I got you back on the second time you know what the right answer to say <laughs> exactly exactly <laughs> well thanks Patrick for coming right, again no worries